Back in the Cold War, when the two largest super-friendly superpowers decided they were completely fine with the risk of being annihilated as long as they could, you know, say the other's economic system was an abomination of hell, the United States had a fantastic idea, because as we all know, all great ideas are driven by the desire to kill one's enemy. That idea? To constantly station bombers flying around the Soviet Union. That way, if the Soviet Union breathed wrong, or they thought it might be attacking, no downtime at all, we could get right to murdering millions of innocent civilians. And the only problem that the U.S. Air Force saw with this fantastically amazing concept was how to keep the bombers constantly flying. Back during the Manhattan Project, Enrico Fermi, one of the fathers of nuclear technology, envisioned nuclear-powered aircraft flying around the world for the benefit of humanity, a sort of flying Tower of Babel to unite the world. And so, an unnamed head engineer at General Electric had an epiphany, or more likely, drug-fueled nightmare, of using nuclear power for bombers. And of course, as it was the 50s, this idea sounded utterly fantastic to the U.S. Air Force, and they tried to build it. Of course, a nuclear reactor's powering electric propellers won't work. No, 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 that's too old school and logical. We instead need nuclear-powered jet engines. All nuclear-powered jets operate on basically one principle. Cold air comes in, gets heated by the incredibly hot radioactive core, and due to the increased heat and therefore lower pressure, is forced out the back. There were two variants of these engines. Indirect air cycle, in which the air would be heated up by a heat exchanger connected to the nuclear core, so that the air would not be directly contaminated, and that was sponsored by Pratt & Whitney. Slash Convair. Direct air cycle, where the air is directly exposed to the nuclear core, was sponsored by General Electric. The U.S. Air Force, of course, favored the direct air cycle, due to it being lighter and more powerful, to the point that engines like this were actually built and flown, such as the General Electric J87. There were two main problems with this. See if you can spot them. Problem A. Because all the air that came in contacted the radioactive core directly, it would become contaminated and therefore spew radiation behind the plane wherever it went. So don't fly it over civilian areas. Problem B. In order to make the crew safe, they needed massive fucking lead shielding that was half the weight of the entire plane. And anyway, at this point, bombers were going out of style, and the ICBM was coming in. So the nightmare purveyors, <coughs> geniuses, at Air Force HQ came up with a even more fantastic new idea called SLAM, Supersonic Low Altitude Missile. I bet whoever came up with that acronym was very, very proud. Basically, SLAM, or Project Pluto, is this version of it, where it was um, going to be known, was a cruise missile with large delta wings and a nuclear-powered jet engine. It would fly at the altitude of, like, approximately just above the treetops at uh, supersonic speeds. So how did this work? Well, SLAM used nuclear ramjets, meaning it needed to be propelled to a high speed first. Ramjets needed air coming in in order to work. This was done with three solid rocket boosters mounted radially around the missile. After a vertical launch, the missile would pitch down to horizontal and activate its nuclear ramjet. SLAM was designed and intended to be automatically operated with as little human intervention as possible. To further this goal, a height map of the Soviet Union and neighboring areas would have been saved on board on the missile's rudimentary computer, and it would have compared the height map via radar to any given point to find its location. Here was the plan for how it was going to be used. Step 0. Load up the missile with 20 nuclear warheads. Make sure to pick the warheads with such nightmare-inducing names, such as Zombie and Stalker. Step 1. Launch the missile towards the Soviet Union, over all your Western allies, leaving behind contamination as you go. The director of the program reassured Congress that the radioactive fumes would do no damage at low altitudes. He conveniently ignored the fact that this plane would be flying through the Gulf Stream and, as later research shows, could have wrought major environmental damage. Step 2. When you get to the Soviet Union, fly this nightmarish low-altitude supersonic missile around, dropping your approximately 20 nuclear warheads over all the largest cities. Step 3. When you are out of warheads, keep on flying around the populated areas, contaminating the Soviet Union. This missile would have been nearly impossible to shoot down due to its supersonic speeds and low altitude. This program was eventually cancelled, not due to it being unfeasible, or even moral gripes. God forbid, that would be too sane. The fear was that on the Soviet Union learning of it, they would launch a nuclear first strike, or develop a similar missile to Project Pluto, which the US would be utterly defenseless against.